It was the biggest game of my life. I was a junior in high school, a scrawny 16-year-old with big hair and bad pimples. I played on the high school basketball team, and our squad, it lacked height and skills. I often played power forward, and look at me. I'm not even six feet tall. The only thing powerful about me are my eyebrows. <laughs> Our enduring rival was Pleasantville, and they had a future LeBron James named Otis Hill. Hill was six foot eight, 200 pounds. He eventually would lead Syracuse to the Final Four. This is an image of Hill. He was a phenom, lineman strong, sprinter fast. He could dunk without a running start when he was in ninth grade. In contrast, most of my high school team could barely touch the rim with a running start. I could barely touch the backboard. The big game took place on a Friday night. It was in the Pleasantville gym with rows upon rows of fans with cowbells and drums. Our guard came out on this wildfire streak, three-pointers, drifters, he ended the game with almost 40 points. Late in the fourth quarter, the score was tied, and suddenly, coach called me in. I hadn't played much that season, but one of our players had fouled out, and suddenly I was there, standing in the middle of the court. This is, of course, the dream, to make the big throw, the great catch, the game-winning touchdown. I remember being so nervous that all I could do was just dry my hands on my shorts. Coach had called a timeout, pulled me aside, and he made it clear I should contain the guard. I shouldn't let the guard go past me. Don't jam the kid, he said. The coach had this raspy voice. Don't jam the kid. Twelve seconds left on the clock. The guard brings up the ball, and I reach in, try and take the ball, and he blows past me. He puts in this layup. Pleasantville was up. Seconds ticked away. Game was over, and, and we had lost. The experience was this dagger of shame, this change what I thought it meant to be human, what I thought it meant to really dream. And in case you think I'm overstating what happened, not long ago I met up with my high school coach, and he still had that same raspy voice. Probably would have been the biggest win in the history of your high school. and you effed up the whole thing. <laughs> I tell the story because it asks an important question. Why do we do what we do? Do we go to school? Do we head to meetings? Do we read books in order to become the best and the brightest? In order to take home that trophy, right? Whether it's money or power or fame. Or, or are we focused on mastery? Do we play sports? Do we head to the office? Do we listen to podcasts in order to improve ourselves in some way, in order to create some type of understanding? These questions are key to something that I call the new smart. I've been studying the new smart, the skill of learning to learn, for years. And I'm going to talk about three skills of the new smart. I think they can change your life. Certainly, it's changed my life from parenting to work, even to basketball. I think we're all pretty familiar with the old smart. It's a view that dominates our cubicles, it's a view that dominates our classrooms, and it's all about innate talent. It's all about hardwired skills, and whether it's math or knitting, the old smart is something you have or you don't. Now, the old smart can actually get you pretty far. The issue is when you start to struggle. Then the old smart, they often give up. After high school, I ended up not playing basketball for years. I thought I was just someone who would crumple under pressure. The new smart is different. It's about development. It's about improvement. It's about curiosity and creativity. It's about critical thinking and real understanding. I want to emphasize that the new smart is really ultimately about the skill of learning to learn. The new smart have a set of strategies, a set of approaches that allow them to gain expertise in just about anything. And we can all join the new smart. We can all gain the skill of learning to learn. We can all get better at getting better. This is important because we live in this world in which learning is a constant. Think about your average day. You wake up in the morning, pop open your phone, and suddenly you have to figure out what interest rates mean for your future. 
you get into the office and now you have to wonder about technological change and what it means for the future of your profession. The research is very clear on this point. Learning has become one of the single best predictors of income, both for individuals and nations. So we're going to get started to talk about the new smart. I'm going to talk about the first strategy. This is a crucial strategy, and it's called metacognition. Because the new smart, they think about their thinking. They learn about their learning. Let me give a quiz question as an example. How many people here know how to drive? And if you know how to drive, just, just raise your hand. Great. A lot of people here know how to drive. Then the follow-up question is, how many people here are above average drivers? You can just keep your hands up. It's great. There's an, there's an issue here because when I looked across the room, most people had their hands up. But that can't actually be true, right? I mean, we can't all be above average. That's statistically impossible. This is a problem of, of metacognition. People are often overconfident. Most people believe that they're above average in terms of looks. Most people believe that they're above average in terms of intelligence. Some overconfidence is, is good. I would not be over up here talking to you if I was not wildly overconfident. <laughs> but overconfidence is dangerous for learning. It leads to weak forms of understanding. And the old smart, they don't want critical feedback. And they certainly don't want critical feedback from themselves. When the new smart are learning, they try to adjust for metacognition by planning out what they're going to know. So they set goals, they set targets. They want to know how exactly they're going to know something. And then while they're learning, they ask themselves questions. Do I know what I know? Could I explain this to a friend? Am I really an above average driver? We're going to talk about the second aspect of the new smart, and that's patterns. When we're learning to learn, we want to look for connections. We want to figure out how an area of expertise really comes together. I have another quiz here for you. What is featured in this image? If you could just raise your hand, a vase? Any tickets for a vase? I feel like I'm at an auction here. Great, we have a number of tickets for a vase, for a funeral urn, and then uh, for an amphora. Great, so it seems like most people said uh, vase. That was actually the easy part of the question. The second part is, how did you know that that was a vase? Was it memory? Again, raise your hand. Experience? And then analogy. Great. I'm going to unpack this question a little bit, because I believe for most of the people in this room, experience was not the answer. Unless you've studied dozens of Ming Dynasty vases, you don't actually have a robust memory of Ming Dynasty vases. I don't think experience is the correct answer either. This specific vase is in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I don't believe that most of you have gone to that museum and seen this vase in person. I believe that the correct answer is analogy. That you looked at the image, you noted the colors, maybe the shapes, maybe even noticed the beards on the men's faces, and you thought to yourself, that looks like ancient Chinese art. The point here is that analogies, patterns, they help us think, they allow us to problem solve. We don't want to learn facts, we want to learn about how facts come together. Another example is, is wine. If you wanted to learn wine and you were a member of the Old Smart, you'd be focused on details. Maybe you'd know the name of a specific grape. Maybe you'd even know how to spell the word sommelier. I'm excited that I actually just pronounced it correctly. <laughs> now, the, the New Smart, they're different. They focus on how facts come together. So they're going to study why is it that sweet wine goes with spicy food? Why is it that the tannins in red wine interact with the fattiness in cheese? You can do this yourself when you're learning. Compare and contrast. Look for similarities and differences. When you're practicing, don't practice the same thing over and over again. This is true whether it's tennis or acting. Mix up your practice. So let's say you want to get better at classical music, don't spend a whole study session on Beethoven. Instead, play Beethoven, then Bach, then Mozart, then Beethoven, then Bach, then Mozart. You're going to get a much richer sense of classical music. 
The third aspect of the new smart that I want to talk about is struggle. The new smart, the skill of learning to learn, it is about making learning difficult, about making learning a, a struggle. Another quiz question here. Let's imagine for a moment you have to learn a set of directions, and let's imagine that the stakes are high and the directions are complicated. So you have to assemble, I don't know, 10 IKEA tables before a big party. <laughs> so would you reread the directions? Can you just raise your hand? Great. Summarize. And then circle. The correct answer here is, is summarizing. And it's not even close. Summarizing is often 30% more effective than these other strategies. Part of the reason is that summarizing makes us look for connections. But just as important, when we summarize, we're working harder. We're more active in terms of our learning. We're really struggling to understand. Again, you can do this yourself. First, don't use highlighters. I don't care if they're pink or yellow or green. They are an old, smart tool. They're very passive. And certainly, you've had the experience where you've seen people who've highlighted basically the entire page. Instead, talk to yourself. Now, I'm going to admit, talking to yourself in the office, people might move away from you. But it's a highly effective way to learn. One study found that talking to yourself it's like having an additional 10 points in terms of IQ because it's making learning harder. You're really struggling to understand that material. It slows you down. Also, tests, quizzes. I know they have a terrible reputation somewhere in between you know, rats and, and dentists. But they are a, a great way to learn. This is why I have been asking you so many quiz questions, and I'm going to admit that these quiz questions might be even a little bit confusing because I want you to struggle. I want you to learn more. The new smart, it, it, changed, my, it changed my life. I started using analogies a lot more. They're a great way to spark creativity. This is why comedians often use analogies. It was Jerry Seinfeld who once said, Toddlers are like blenders, but without a top. <laughs> I also tried to encourage my children to really struggle with learning, to embrace the difficulties of learning. And so when they were learning math for the first time, I encouraged them to learn on an abacus. This is what an abacus looks like. Ancient device predates the invention of the alphabet, predates the invention of glass. And one of the reasons it's uh, such an effective tool is that people actually have to work. They move these beads up and down. And a number of studies have found it's a great way to learn math. And finally, I applied the new smart to myself. About five years ago, I decided to start playing hoops again. I started to play basketball again. And at first, it was like the Otis Hill game all over again. I would you know, airball easy shots. Opponents would target me for steals. And so I decided to make learning hard for myself. I hired a basketball tutor, Dwayne Samuels, and it was very clear he made learning difficult for me. Uh, I was suddenly a 40-something, you know, trying to dribble behind my back. I tried to engage in more metacognition, so I'd videotape myself to figure out my soft spots. I also tried to make sure that I wouldn't repeat my practice, so I would shoot a 12-footer, then a 10-footer, and then an 8-footer to, to mix up how I learned. Now, the good news is I got better at basketball. I started to hit three-pointers. The bad news, this type of learning, it's difficult. It's embarrassing. It's awkward. Sometimes when I would go to visit my basketball tutor, you know, most of his other clients were middle schoolers. <laughs> and I would see their parents, and I'd try not to make eye contact. You know, I just, it's just so, so embarrassing. Now, I never became the best basketball player on the court. But that was not the goal. One of the central ideas of the New Smart is that we can't continually compare ourselves to the Joneses. The goal here is development, not dominance. My bigger point here is that learning to learn, the New Smart, it's about far more than classrooms, about far more than textbooks. It is about an approach to existence, one that emphasizes improvement, one that emphasizes
growth. This is what I want for my own kids. This is what I want for myself. This is what I want for the world. And we can start this new world today. After you leave this talk or leave this building today, summarize what you've heard, whether it's my talk or David's talk or Ty's talk. That summary, if you write an email to a friend, if you you know, call up a, a relative and, and summarize what you've learned. You've taken steps to metacognate, to think about your thinking. You'll have worked harder to engage the material. I'll also hope that you've thrown in an analogy or two. But most importantly, you'll have taken the first step in learning to learn. Thank you. <laughs>